Well, hello, everyone. I'm Donna Martinez. Welcome to Locker Room Talk. Election night 2014, a huge night in North Carolina politics, but not just for who won and who lost. The results of election night will help chart the course of North Carolina into 2015. So what does it all mean? Joining me with analysis are two of my John Locke Foundation colleagues, Becky Gray, Vice President for Outreach, and Rick Henderson, Managing Editor of Carolina Journal. Becky and Rick, welcome to Locker Room Talk. Thank Thanks you. A lot. Okay, Becky, what's the headline out of election night? What does it all mean? Well, the headline has to be Obama's policies, North Carolina General Assembly policies put to the test. Who wins? Clearly, the North Carolina General Assembly policies won. You know, what we saw during this Senate election was, from the very beginning, Kay Hagan was going to tie the General Assembly around Tom Tillis's neck. He was going to tie her very closely to President Obama and his policies. President Obama helped that recently during the election. He said, this election is about my policies. Right. It was put before North Carolina voters, and they overwhelmingly favor North Carolina General Assembly, the reforms, the the differences that a Republican-led General Assembly have made really since 2010. Um, so I think that's the headline. That's what we saw. We saw it in the U.S. Senate race between Hagan and Tillis, but we also saw it really in those legislative races and where we come out at the end of the day of who controls the General Assembly. You know, I think they outperformed anybody's predictions on how well they would do. They picked up a seat in the North Carolina Senate. They have a net loss of three seats in the North Carolina House. Uh, this is the lowest loss for a midterm governor during his first, the, the party of the governor during his first midterm session. So I think in anybody's book, this was a very, very good election for Republicans in North Carolina. Rick, what was your takeaway? First of all, Tillis beating Kay Hagan, was that a surprise to you? Should it have been a surprise to people? Oh, it was a bit of a surprise to me just because if you looked at the polling data, there was a fairly steady trend throughout that Kay Hagan had a, a slight lead. Tillis led in a few polls. In the last couple of weeks of polling, the two had pulled even. But you had to look at the top line number, and in both cases, Kay Hagan was getting somewhere between 45 to 47 percent of the vote, and Tillis was getting about the same, which means there was an undecided factor there, sometimes 5, 6 percent or more, with the remainder going to Sean Haw, the libertarian. Well, when you have a 5 or 6 percent uh, voters who are undecided, they're going to vote for somebody, or they're going to stay home, one or the other. And the fact is that Tillis, the undecided voters tended to break toward Tillis probably about two to one, which is not unusual when you have an incumbent who's unpopular. Both candidates had negative favorability ratings. Both had more people saying they disliked them than liked them. But in the case in which you have an incumbent, sort of the throw the bums out mentality mm -hmm. uh, sets in, and this worked to Tillis's favor. The win was by about a percentage point and a half, and that's about where it would have happened had the undecideds broken in that way. Now, the critics of the General Assembly had often, over the past year or so, targeted some election reform laws that the legislature had passed. There was an allegation, a concern by some on the left, that turnout would be affected negatively. What do we know about the turnout numbers at this point? Well, we're still getting some of those together, but you're right, that's what the Moral Monday protests were all about for the last two years, and they targeted and talked a lot about voter ID and the other changes to election laws that were made with the intent of the General Assembly to protect and make sure that the integrity of the elections were in place. Um, again, the Moral Monday crowd said the intention was to suppress voters. We're still getting those numbers together of, you know, who exactly voted, who was registered, those kind of things, but it appears that the turnout for this election was at least as good as it was in 2010, and early voting was up by, I think it was 20 percent. Now, we also know that uh, there are different groups of people who were messaged differently by both of the campaigns. Can we tell from the exit polling at this point exactly which campaign was successful with which demographic group? Uh, yes, we can. The, the, notice, the notion comes out of the gender gap, the fact that uh, Hagen, Kay Hagan was winning women voters and Tom Tillis was winning male voters. Well, as it turns out, uh, Kay Hagan had her appeal to male voters was low. She actually That's underperformed. That's kind of a reversal of yes. the media narrative, That's isn't right. it? That's right. She underperformed among male voters. And also, something that's not a surprise is that Tillis actually did really well 
with married voters, especially married voters with children at home. And so a lot of, to the extent there were any specifics in Senator Hagan's rhetoric about what her goals were in Washington, it was about ideas that weren't for middle class families. Well, if that's the case, then she didn't get her message across very well because middle class families did not support her. Well, and along those lines, too, she really kind of advocated the position of the war on women and tried to paint Tom Tillis as someone who was not in favor of women. And although she did outperform him with women, it was not very much. I think she his numbers were um, 12 percent, hers were 15 percent. So there was not a big gender gap with the female vote voters, which it was a little surprising to me, given the rhetoric during the election, particularly coming out of the Kay Hagan camp, that Tom Tillis was not in favor of women, that Republican policies had disenfranchised women. Um, you know, now most of that was about free contraceptives and open access to abortion, which, you know, many, many women like you and I, Don, I know because we've talked about this, <laughs> believe that women's issues are go a lot further than that. So I would say that these exit polls that we're looking at, who actually voted for Tom Tillis would end indicate that most women agree with us and that those women's issues go way beyond abortion and contraceptives. Now, the messaging was pretty fascinating as well. You had Senator Hagan's campaign really trying to make this race about Tom Tillis's record in the General Assembly as House Speaker. You had the Tillis campaign trying to make it about Senator Hagan's association and votes with President Obama. Can we tell which one prevailed? Well, what we can tell is that voters, from exit polling information once again, voters said that their biggest concern was the economy, especially the voters who voted for Speaker Tillis. And the economy goes far beyond uh, just issues of dollars and cents, but enters into the issue of health care. And you heard again and again and again, you heard this in advertising from outside groups, that small business owners were very worried about Obamacare, that people were seeing their premiums go up dramatically because of Obamacare. And for that reason, the role of the economy in the election was very important because people are not confident about the economy. And also the fact that uh, Senator Hagan supported all of the debt raising measures that went through this Congress. And so he was very easily able to tie her to him because she really didn't distance herself in substance from any of those policies. Well, and I think some of the foreign policy, the ISIS crisis, if you will, and the Ebola situation also didn't play well for her as she was tied closer to what many think is Obama's failed leadership. Now, not only was the Hagan tillis Sean Ha race very fascinating, and we can talk a little bit more another time about the libertarian influence on the race, but of course now we have a little bit of an idea of what the General Assembly is going to be like in 2015, and we will talk about that a little bit later in the program. You're going to continue to be with me to look at the analysis of the race. Becky Gray, Rick Henderson, you'll be back a little bit later in the program. Right here in the locker room.